The market, like the Lord, <laughs> helps those who help themselves. True. But unlike the Lord, the market does not forgive those who know not what they do. <laughs> That's Warren Buffett, 1983. <laughs> so what we're going to try to do for introduction tonight is talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, what we think uh, is the proper behavior for knowing generally what you do uh, in the stock market. And so um, we think that to be successful in investing, <clears throat> one has to uh, identify what it is you can know, but more importantly identify what you can't know. And what you want to do is to put all of your efforts on what you can know and no effort on what you can't. And we think that's the great discipline that separates those that can produce good long-term results from those that can't. And we think most investors spend most of their time deliberating a whole bunch of variables that have no predictive value whatsoever. Zero, negative. And in that category, uh, we would put all geopolitical and macroeconomic events. Uh, by the way, just ask any questions as we go, and we'll take this thing wherever you want as we go along. Um, and so, <laughs> because most investors, and I'm talking about uh, professional investors, people that manage large amounts of money, fiduciaries, uh, pension plans, uh, because most of these individuals spend most of their decision-making deliberating on geopolitical and macroeconomic events, the stock market fluctuates wildly based upon all that stuff that you read in the paper every day. Whether it be uh, Brexit, or the problems in Greece, or the political problems they're having down in Brazil these days, or the growth rate in China, or what Janet Yellen might have said at lunch today, or God forbid, what might have happened in our elections, uh, basically. And so, uh, because most investors focus on those variables, the stock market fluctuates wildly based upon all that stuff. And the real great discipline in investing, we think, is to be able to ignore that and accept the fact that stocks are going to fluctuate dramatically in the short term and that we have no control over that. And most investors can't get there. And in fact, the more intelligent one is, the more that they can't accept the fact that they can't control these short term fluctuations. And more importantly, the more money that they have, somebody has to invest. Uh, the more they think that they can hire somebody by paying them a lot of money to figure all that out. And we think there's a point in these investors' careers, and I say that because it happened to me and it's happened to all investors until they get the right disciplines, that they wake up one morning and acknowledge the idea that they don't know what the heck they're doing. And it's frightening. And the result of that is that they bury that, but their decision making becomes even more emotional. And this whole thing just sort of feeds on itself. And in the short term, the stock market is a manic depressive, unpredictable mess. And for most people, we, um, uh, we don't doubt the idea, we acknowledge the idea that for most people, it's a pretty scary place and why would they ever put their hard-earned <coughs> money into the stock market? So, that said, let's see what it is we can know. So we think all the stock market is is a place, is a huge, giant supermarket auction place for you to buy and sell businesses. 
And if you look at it that way, it's actually quite remarkable. Because you can select from tens of thousands of businesses all over the planet. And you can find any kind of business that you want if you know what you're looking for. And the cost of entry is virtually minimal. When I started in this business, uh, a trade that would cost thousands of dollars uh, at TD Ameritrade, which is where we execute our trades, today costs six nine six dollars and ninety five cents, and Schwab is charging four ninety five. And so the, the cost of entry is minimal, uh, which also means that the uh, minimal amount that one needs to invest in companies is also minimal, uh, and it's completely liquid. You don't have to buy the whole company. You have the ability to just to buy a piece of it, which is really cool. And, you know, if you put in $2,000 into some company, and then you decide you need some snow tires this fall, you could pull $500 out. Normally in a business, that would be difficult to do. So we think, actually, if you're going into the supermarket to look for businesses, um, you can um, you, you use the same variables in selecting a business, we think, as you would use to purchase anything. And they would be, what is the quality of the merchandise that you're looking for? And then how much are you paying for it? And we think, over time, you can know those two things absolutely down. So, qualitatively, um, as time goes on, what you need to do is to define a criteria in your mind as to what it would be that why one company would have a distinct advantage over their peers. And as time goes on and you work on that, that becomes tighter and tighter and tighter, and the focus becomes more and more clear. And we think over time, you can see with complete clarity exactly what you want to own in a business. And we just happen to like businesses that are run by people that treat their employees well and energize everybody that works there. Um, and, uh, and, and that just happens to be what we look for in a business. But if you thought you wanted some megalomaniac to run the organization that didn't want to pay their people very well, you could find that too. You could find anything you want. There are tens of thousands of businesses literally all over the planet that you could look for um, to identify what it is you want. In fact, there are funds out there, they call them vice funds. And all they buy are cigarettes and tobacco and uh, things that are characterized by society as, as vice. So you could find any kind of business that you want. And so we think, with, with, as time goes on, with complete clarity, you could become a serious business analyst and identify what it is that you want in a business that's going to give them a distinct advantage over their peers over a long period of time. And then we think there are so many opportunities available that with a lot of hard work, you can go out and find exactly the business that fits your criteria. And we think you could do those two things with complete clarity. So, once you've identified the target, uh, then what you need to do is identify what would represent a fair price for somebody that's going to own this business for a long period of time. And so, um, you could read Ben Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, and basically what a fair price would be, would be to identify how much company, how much cash, uh, investing is about putting up money today and getting more back in the future. So what you need to do is to identify what that company is earning today 
and how much could they earn indefinitely into the future? And what are the odds of that cash flow stream uh, being sustainable uh, over a period of time? And the longer period of time that you can identify that, the more solid uh, this investment's gonna be over time. And is it gonna go up? Could it stay the same? Could it go down? And it really doesn't matter. What you need to do though is identify what that cash flow stream is gonna look like indefinitely into the future. And then, once you could do that, you could determine what would represent a fair price to purchase that business today for a long-term owner of the business. So we think, with complete clarity, you could create a model as to exactly the type of business you want to own. You could go find exactly the business that fits that model. Within a pretty good range, you could figure out what would represent a fair price for a long-term investor. And if you could do those things, then we think the more manic depressive, the more ridiculous the short-term fluctuations in the stock market, the more emotional everybody else is, the better it is for you. The idea is that you want to be a business analyst and not a stock market analyst. Very few investors can ever get there. They cannot accept the fact that there's going to be all these short-term fluctuations that they have no control of. And they're going to get elated when things go up, and they're going to get depressed when things go down. You just behave. When things go up, you behave one way. When things go down, you behave another way. So that neither one is good nor bad. And the idea is you're going to find great businesses and own them for long periods of time. And this crazy, ridiculous thing called the stock market is going to give you the opportunities to get entry points that make great economic sense. And if $30 a share makes great economic sense, and it goes to 25 what's the appropriate behavior? Yeah, certainly not to sell. <laughs> and if it goes from 25 to 20, and if it goes to 20 to 15, the appropriate behavior is to buy more. It's finding that merchandise that you want that just keeps getting going on sale. And the beautiful thing about the stock market is you don't have to buy the whole, all, everything at once. You can ease into it. And as it keeps going down, you can keep <coughs> reducing your cost basis. But you have to have done the whole work to have complete conviction to do that. Rather than to think, oh my God, somebody else knows more than I do. You have to be able to research it to the point where you have that strong feeling that you know more than the other folks do. And certainly because most of them aren't even making decisions based upon the same variables that you're looking at. They're making decisions based on Brexit, or what the, what the latest tweet was today, or <laughs> what might have happened in China, or all the stuff, and, you, and we're looking at a completely different set of variables. And the idea behind this is to be able to look at the same set of facts as most other investors and come to a completely different conclusion. And believe me, there's a ton of information out there with the, now that, that's just gotten more and more and more as time has gone on because of the internet. I used to have to travel all over the country to visit these companies. I really don't have to anymore. All the information is there. This is, it's a complete even playing field. There's a ton of information available to everybody. The trick is to be able to look at the same information and come out with a different conclusion. <coughs> Any questions? All right, uh, every year we have um, 
Every, uh, it used to be every year we used to open the meeting with this little Mr. Market. I'm gonna read it for you just to kind of wrap up this piece before we go into full questions. <clears throat> Mr. Market, long ago, Ben Graham described the mental attitude towards market fluctuations that are most conducive to investment success. He said, you should imagine market quotations as coming from a remarkably accommodating fellow named Mr. Market, who is your partner in a private business. Without fail, Mr. Market appears daily and names a price at which he will either buy your interest or sell you his. Even though the business the two of you own may have economic characteristics that are stable, Mr. Market's quotations will be anything but. For sad to say, the poor fellow has an incurable emotional problem. At times he feels euphoric and can see only the favorable factors affecting the business. When in that mood, he names a very high buy-sell price because he fears that you will snap up his interest and rob him of imminent gains. At other times, he's depressed. He can see nothing but trouble ahead for both the business and the world. On these occasions, he will name a very low price, and he is terrified that you will unload your interest on him. Mr. Market has another endearing characteristic. He doesn't mind being ignored. If his quotation is uninteresting to you today, he'll be back with a new one tomorrow. Transactions are strictly at your option. Under these conditions, the more manic depressive his behavior, the better for you. But like Cinderella at the ball, you must heed one warning that everything will turn into pumpkin and mice. Mr. Market is there to serve you, not to guide you. It is his pocketbook, not his wisdom, that you will find useful. If he shows up someday in a particularly foolish mood, you are free to either ignore him or take advantage of him. But it will be disastrous if you fall under his influence. And that's out of uh, Berkshire Hathaway's 1987 annual report. So, let's see, a um, couple of housekeeping items, obviously. I uh, want to introduce our team that's expanded a little bit since last year. Uh, Ginger Belker and Michelle Blood is someplace here. Uh, Jeremy Brown and Dominic Piazza. Uh, one thing that we've accomplished in life. Oh, and David Weil. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> um, one thing that we've accomplished in the last year is that uh, we now have succession in place for actually two generations. Um, and both Jeremy and Dominic have been in a deep learning uh, uh, kind of mode for the last year. And I, I can honestly say that at this point in time, if something happened to me, my suggestion to be for you would be to put as much money into the Tarkio fund as you can. Because <laughs> uh, we, I think going forward, um, they are learning this trade in a way that is going to give them great advantage going forward and that we think <coughs> few people in this industry have had that kind of trading ground. And it's been sort of a parallel training process that we've used uh, rather than exactly what I'm doing it is parallel to what I'm doing uh, in a little different marketplace and you can ask me about that later if you'd like. Uh, the other huge event for the year is that uh, uh, Ginger uh, is our compliance expert and uh, she just completed an audit by the SEC that lasted almost a year and a half. <laughs> and virtually, I mean, virtually, after a year and a half of combing through every single thing that we've done, uh, the result was a very, very slight little adjustment that we had to make. Uh, our attorney, our hired attorney that we used in the mutual fund from day one, 
thinks it's the most remarkable thing he's ever seen. Okay, uh, we, uh, Dominic has been working on um, getting our fund on different platforms. So do you want to give us an update, Dom, on what you've achieved there? Uh, but yeah, we're on TD, Schwab, and Vanguard, like we have been, and now we're on E-Trade and Scott Trade. Well. Yeah, so uh, all you have to, if you have a Schwab account, you just punch in T-A-R-K-X and you can buy it instantly. And we've only got one really major platform left, and that's Fidelity. And uh, we're working on that. Um, just a shout out. Uh, thanks for reminding me, Jared. Uh, David's running uh, Delano uh, Investment Advisory and doing a great job. And if anybody wants to talk about David's process or style, maybe during the break or afterwards, uh, he'd be delighted, obviously, to chat. And Michelle, as always, is after 35 some odd years, we're a tight partnership. Um, we're going to go into questions. If you want to pull up the company slides, we have an email question. You want to start with that? Yeah. Eric Moore emailed in. Uh, could you please provide some information on the current activist situation at Whole Foods? And we'll stop there and then shoot you the next one later. So, as you, many of you might be aware, um, we've had a great history with Whole Foods uh, for a number of years. And we took the majority of the position. Uh, was established in 2009. Uh, it was also one of these things where stock was going down and we kept buying lower. And I think we started buying at a 40, um, and the lowest price we got was eight. Uh, within 12 months, it was 130. Uh, it's split since then, so the price of the stock today isn't reflective of uh, what it was back at that point in time. Uh, but they've, they've run into some issues, some competitive issues, uh, that has uh, slowed down their growth rate um, uh, to almost a, a standstill here recently, over the last year and a half, I would say. Um, and the question is, re is in regards to, uh, there's some activist investors that have come in and are trying to, you know, uh, force Whole Foods uh, to behave differently than they would normally behave. and to put some people on the board. Um, and uh, we are long-term owners of these companies. And every company that we've owned, and, we, and it's, our longest holding was bought in 1988, to give you some um, a framework here. And so every company that we've owned for a long period of time have gone through periods to where, you know, that they have not performed as well, they've had some issues that have stalled their growth for some period of time. Um, and what we try to do during those periods, uh, you know, we, we expect that, we know that's gonna happen. Um, that's not something that uh, shakes us out at all ever. In fact, it's usually an opportunity to buy a lot more stock at cheaper prices. But what we do, and, and the other thing I don't really wanna do you know, I don't sit around trying to figure out, you know, what their strategy should be and look at what they're doing and go, well, I do it this way and they're doing it this way and maybe we should, you know, get out of the company because, you know, they didn't uh, adopt the strategy that I would adopt. Well, what, what do I know about running a grocery store? I'm a passive investor. So... Um, what I, what we want to make sure is that when they go through these difficult times, and, and again, uh, as we all know, and we'll, I'm sure, go through it at some point, you know, our criteria is the company's culture. That they create a culture that gets the best out of everybody, and they behave in a certain manner 
that uh, energizes uh, the employees and becomes a learning machine. And, and we think those kind of learning machines have the ability to solve problems. And the way they solve problems is to make a mistake and then correct on it. And so what we're interested in when a company runs into a, some kind of a brick wall is that that culture doesn't change, that their behavior doesn't change. Um, and uh, so that's what we're going through with Whole Foods. And this activist investor comes in um, and tries to create problems for them um, and did it in a very visible way that brought a lot of negative publicity to the situation. And um, we think their behavior has been absolutely exemplary. Uh, and they dealt with the, the, the uh, activist. Uh, they brought a couple of new people on the board, not the ones that they selected, but people that they're, you know, when a company grows as fast as Whole Foods has, um, you do get a little sloppy. And we, we, you know, we owned Starbucks for 18 years. And we saw that with them a couple of times. You go through these huge growth spurts um, and it's easy to get a little lax. And they do need to tighten up a little bit and they brought in some uh, board members that could bring in some expertise on those areas um, and uh, have laid out very clearly what their strategy is um, and have already started to you know, tack on it a little bit, move, you know, uh, just here and there. Um, and um, the activists have uh, backed off here. And so we couldn't be more pleased uh, with the way Whole Foods has behaved, not only through the activist situation, but through the whole uh, 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 year and a half to where they've been under more pressure than they've seen since they've been a public company. How many frogs do you have to kiss before you find a prince? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'll, that's a good question. And, and uh, we just went through this discussion on uh, another situation. Um, and uh, and uh, the only thing that we're concerned about is that they keep kissing more frogs. What was the question? If they, if they, yeah, the, the question was, how many frogs does one have to kiss and then I cut them off at that point. <laughs> uh, but the idea is how many times you have to fail uh, before, you, before you get there. And we don't really care. We just want them to keep kissing more frogs. You know, that they keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. And through that process, we think they're going to become a greater, greater learning organization. And when they get it right, you know, um, the whole organization is going to be better off for it because they kept the adjustment process going on, or as Bill would categorize, keep kissing more frogs. Actually, my question was more of how many th how many prospective investments do you have to go through to find one that's worth buying? How many frogs are you kissing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not you the know, same. Um, we. <clears throat> we have been sort of coming to the conclusion that um, that being a business analyst is cumulative. That the more you do this, the better you get. Which is quite a self-serving statement. <laughs> uh, but. Watching Warren Buffett's career, uh, we think there's a lot of validity to it and until you start to lose enough gray matter to where it starts to slide. Uh, but um, uh, I actually think that at this point in my career, um, I can sort things out much quicker than I could 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And that our success ratio is much higher today um, as to getting into something and having to back out. Uh, and when we do back out, it's usually within the first three or four months. 
Yeah, Daryl. So I, I, I guess I have two questions. The first one is kind of related to this, and that's so. So are you constantly scanning for more companies? Are you? I, and I think that kind of leads to a kickoff on this question. Yeah. Uh, it's an inter uh, I like the word, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about that word you used, uh, which was scanning. And we think, uh, you know, there's a real issue these days with um, active management versus passive management. And that uh, active management has really fallen short of passive management. And I believe one of the key reasons and most great investors uh, have been very um, quantitative value oriented, meaning that they look for companies' stocks that are statistically cheap. Um, and you can scan for that. I mean, you could use a computer and scan for that. And we think, I think, that's one of the key reasons these days that the great, some of the great investors have not been able to keep up. Because it's squeezed the variability, that they just don't get as cheap as they would have otherwise, because you can pick it up quicker. And when they do get that cheap, they don't stay there very long. And unless you know that company dead, which means you've already had a huge history with it, you know, you can't do the research quick enough to take advantage of that little spot. And so we're kind of feeling, uh, we're kind of feeling good because you can't scan for what we look for. Could you pull up the criteria? That will be number seven. You know, there, it's about, you know, uh, human behavior. You can't scan for this stuff, it's culture. <coughs> Um, and there's no, I mean, there's no way, even with this, with artificial intelligence, you can't scan for this, which we think gives us a good runway in, a, in an environment where a lot of people are finding it tough these days. And so the word scan, I, I say we don't scan, but we re, I mean, you know, one company might lead to another, and one company's culture leads to another. We have a lot of people that know what we do, and they're giving us ideas that are companies that might have that particular culture. Um, but I don't think we use, we, we don't, you know, scanning means to me using some computer system. And we think our edge is not using a computer system. And so, so that leads me to ask the question, so how do you choose which companies you investigate in a way so that you feel like you actually know what they are? Yeah, we just, I mean, used to be I just read everything. Now the three of us read everything. <laughs> and so through all that, and, and the great thing about being an ultra long-term investor, again, our, uh, you saw before in the slide uh, what years, uh, I want to go back there. I mean, look at when we first purchased these things. Yeah. We've literally held these forever. And so um, holding them for these extraordinary long periods of time, we don't need to come up with new ideas very often. In fact, if we went a year or two years without coming up with a new idea, it would be fine. In fact, it'd probably be better, to tell you the truth. Um, and so, you know, the, the ideas originate from, uh, I like, I, I use the story when we bought uh, National Instruments, or when we uh, first found National Instruments, um, that uh, I just read an article that talked about this guy, Dr. T, uh, Dr. Touchard, uh, that, who was at the time probably my age, uh, and he had a hundred year plan for the company. And so I go, oh, okay, that's a starting point. And so I'm looking for these very, you know, um, not ambiguous starting points. Where you go, oh my God, that's something, I mean, it, they could have not turned out to be, you know, something that we might have been interested in, but that's certainly a good starting point. And again, it's hard to scan for that stuff. And then we take it from there, yes. 
So Ross, when you, how do you decide when to get out? You said you used to own Starbucks, but you don't now. Yeah. So how, how do you, I mean, that's the other side of the issue, right? The, the response that you, I assume. Now our pre preference is to never get out. And so the Rogers Corporation we've had since 1988. And uh, over the last year and a half, I'd say it's been our second top performer. Um, and so our preference would be to hold them indefinitely. Uh, the reasons to get out would be A, that it gets just mindlessly, grossly overvalued. Uh, not slightly overvalued. But, but ridiculously overvalued, or the culture starts to change. Uh, and really, the Starbucks is a unique situation. And in the fact that um, the reason why we uh, were so interested in the company to start with, and over time, which made us so committed to it, was uh, that uh, they had an opportunity, and they and they um, uh, were able to capitalize on the idea that uh, it was a strong brand that people uh, identified with. And uh, we felt at the time, and still do probably, uh, I don't, that uh, you know we understand that addictive products make. Unbelievable businesses, and people really gravitate towards an addictive product. And we felt at the time, and still feel today, that coffee is probably the only addictive product we'll have the opportunity to invest in that doesn't hurt people. So we went all in, and the brand, the brand became so strong that our clients, which we didn't have the mutual fund at the time, so we had a lot more interaction on you know, what we bought, why we bought, what we sold, um, that uh, the customer's reaction to the brand, both favorably and unfavorably, uh, was gonna kill me. I mean, I would get <coughs> many, many calls from people that had a bad latte. They were angry. I mean, it's just had this emotional, this this vile emotional attachment to this brand, and the stock uh, during 08 and 09, you know, really has some huge swings, and uh, we tried to manage through that, and then finally, you know, we felt that um, after 18 years, you know, the company had gotten to the size where we really gotten. I mean, they, I don't know how many tens of thousands of stores they had that we had, we gotten the, the most out of it and I couldn't handle it anymore. And that was the primary reason to get out of Star Or we would still, but we had an opportunity to get back in and I chose actually to buy the Whole Foods at eight rather than the, the Starbucks at 13. And that was a conscious decision because I didn't want to go down that path again. We have a little more buffer now uh, with the fund. And that was one of the reasons why uh, we think the fund's going to make us better investors over time. Yeah, Bill. I've been with you for 33 years. Thank you, Bill. Uh, one of the things that, that, you, know, you asked why do you get out of something, what I've noticed is they get bought out. Yeah, we've got two of them this year. And generally speaking, they are very good in the short term, but then you have to figure out what you're going to do with that money. We didn't have any problem this year. But, no, but I mean, um, you have something that's really good and then unfortunately gets called away. Yeah. I think the JLG and Val Spar, for example. And now, uh, so, that's unfortunate. To, to, for everybody's information, uh, we have two one company that just got bought out for cash, which is Val Spar, which we own since 1991. 1991 uh, for, Many people's cost basis were literally zero. Um, it's just a paint company out of Minneapolis, but um, and they got bought out for cash, and we had no problem redeploying that cash over the last uh, twelve months or so. Uh, and then uh, another very large holding, which we've had since 2003 is level three, and half of that is getting bought out for cash. 
um, probably in September. And the other half is, uh, is turning into stock of the company that they're merging with, basically, which is CenturyLink. Um, and so uh, this is a good opportunity to let everybody know that the accounts that are uh, taxable accounts, uh, we're going to have some capital gains with the Valspar purchase and the level three, half of the level three purchase. Okay. And the game plan so far has been that um, we, uh, we were very excited to redeploy the Valspar money because we had some opportunities that popped up that we thought were uh, very <coughs> exciting. Um, and the level three money, we're gonna try to, it's gonna come probably in the end of September and we're going to try to hang on to that for the taxable accounts so that uh, for April 15th of 2018. Uh, and so be sure you call us to draw out that money to pay your taxes on these two issues that we have no control over getting bought out. Occasionally, you, they can turn into a bond. Um, JLG got bought out and it was supposed to close in January and it closed on the 31st of December. All yeah. of a sudden, here was a huge bond of the extra income that there was no way to plan for. And yeah, we actually had that with uh, with Fairhold here a couple yeah. years ago as well, which was didn't make us very happy. Who, who bought the first cap of um, uh, level three? Century Link. Half turns into cash, oh. half turns into Century Link oh, stock. Okay, so it's all uh, level three is now totally part of Century Link. Uh, will be in September. Yeah. The two stocks are trading tandemly. Yeah. Okay. Right. Is that the reason that CenturyLink has been added to the list? Yes. Well, no. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, I think this, this will be a good point in time to go to the second uh, uh, email question. Second. Also from Eric Moore, by the way. In regard to the level three CenturyLink acquisition, what do you plan to do with the new company's stock and will it be generated by the transaction? Yeah, so what are we gonna do uh, with the, uh, how do we view uh, this transaction with CenturyLink buying uh, or merging with level three? So uh, as you may uh, remember that level three owns uh, we think the largest fiber optic, pure fiber optic, end-to-end -end fiber optic network on the planet. And we think that's the most valuable asset one could ever own. And uh, CenturyLink is, uh, is a little more complicated situation. Uh, uh, the, the core of CenturyLink uh, is the old Quest or US West. And so, um, uh, there are um, pure fiber optic networks, and level three is a long haul network, which means it's the, the backbone that everything flows into primarily. Although they do have some what they call metro, which is kind of backbone stuff but goes out into large cities. Um, U.S. West, the, the legacy business there, uh, is what they call POTS plain old telephone service. Um, and that's somewhat antiquated. Uh, a lot of communities are not very economical to get the service out to. There's always uh, regulatory struggles as to whether they get paid or don't get paid. Um, there are several companies that all they are are POTS companies, and they really struggle as publicly traded companies. And so, um, but if you, re I, you may not remember, but uh, US West, I don't know if they just turned into Quest, you might know, or they got bought out by Quest. But anyways, he went on a rampage, as did Level 3 and a whole bunch of other companies on Montana Power to build out these end-to-end -end pure fiber networks. Um, and they got in big trouble along with everybody else that did that. And when they, these companies got into trouble, is when we established the level three position, by the way. Um, and these are very, very valuable assets that just got overbuilt for a period of time. 
And so uh, CenturyLink has this huge uh, fiber optic network that Quest built, and then two others that they purchased of almost equal size. And so they have a huge, also, fiber footprint. They still have this legacy POTS business, and because of that, uh, CenturyLink stock has been a terrible performer. And when this deal was announced, uh, CenturyLink stock was on a valuation basis very, very cheap. In fact, the stock was so cheap that the dividend, so if a company pays a fixed dividend and the stock drops, the dividend payment goes up. The percentage that you get to buy the new buyers of the stock get a higher percentage rate on their dividend return. And so centrally they got so cheap that the dividend itself it was paying nine and a half percent. Yeah, could compare that to your local CD. <laughs> um, and and I think maybe the POTS business was right around a little under 30%. Uh, when you add the level three business, it's going to be closer to 15. <clears throat> so it's really going to change the whole dynamics of this business. And you're adding, you know, the three, all of the fiber that, that level three put together on top of all this great fiber that centrally they put together. And um, it's a much more valuable asset than level three would have been on their own. Um, the negative was for us that, you know, we liked the management of level three. They actually came out of um, Peter Kiewit construction, which was uh, uh, run by a fellow by the name of Walter Scott, who's Warren Buffett's best friend. And so culturally, we liked a lot of the things that was going on there. And, um, and when the merger was announced, um, the old Centrally Link CEO was anointed as being the new CEO of the combined company. <coughs> And that, we didn't know this guy, and obviously it hasn't been stellarly run, uh, or it wouldn't have been as cheap. They, they just haven't dealt with the pot situation, probably as effectively as they could have. And so we were a little concerned about that. Uh, but um, while the deal was is uh, being fermented, so to speak, um, the uh, CenturyLink stock dropped again dramatically, and we actually <coughs> bought CenturyLink stock, paying this 9.5% dividend with the Valspar money. So the answer to your question is sort of both. Uh, and then uh, our friends, the activists, come in. Uh, they weren't really our friends in the Whole Foods situation. But a group came in that actually has some um, knowledge of the telecommunications industry. And uh, they have uh, kept the, the, the plan now through the efforts of the activists. Um, and we know the board uh, of level three is a good board. Uh, they know this business. It's very unusual that you get a good board. And uh, they jumped on the activists' suggestion that they keep Jeff Story to run the combined businesses, which is the old level three CEO. Uh, so we're liking this a lot more than we did before. And we're very, very happy about this. And it, it you know, creates some cash. Uh, it was getting to be a very large position. There's, in the portfolio, so uh, going to cash wasn't that bad of a thing, probably, but I didn't want to take it all out. I didn't want to all have to go out, so taking a 2% position in, um, in Century Link is going to take a 5% post-merger position in level 3 to maybe up to 7 again. And we're, that's an area, that's a number we're very comfortable with.
and please, very pleased. Questions? People should feel free to stand up, get some food, some snacks, drinks. Yeah, should we take a break? Yeah. We're going to start the second session with a video. Uh, it's uh, Becky Quick uh, interviewing Warren Buffett on CNBC recently. Uh, some of the subject matter in the video that they talk about is something that we talk about quite a bit over the last couple of years. We've had a, a strong um, a transition from using outside funds to the um, S&P 500 index. Uh, we've uh, avoided purchasing anything that looks, smells like a bond uh, for the last several years. And Jeremy, is there anything else in that video that we need to cover? Uh, active versus mm -hmm. passive management. Yeah. Uh, S&P 500. Um, Rational thought. Yeah, you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have the faintest idea what the stock market's going to do tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year. I, I do know that over time, we talk 10 years or something of sort, but I believe we'll do better than, than, than uh, the bonds, which is the main alternative for bank deposits, maybe fixed dollar investments for people. And uh, they're not going to be able to pick the time to come in. I don't know how to pick the time to come in. I've bought a lot of stocks in the last couple of months that may turn out the stock market goes down 20% or 30%. That won't bother me if I like the businesses I bought. You know, the, there are a lot of people who think you need to be balanced. If you're going to be in stocks, you also need to have balanced in bonds, maybe 60, 40, or 80, 20, or whatever it may be. And I have money and fidelity retirement. I have everything in S&P 500 index funds, like you've written, like you've told people to do, uh, with the exception of Comcast shares, which I own. But everything else is in S&P 500 index funds. And I get a red signal back from Comcast, from Fidelity, saying, this is dangerous. You should not be invested in stocks. Are they right to warn me? No, I think that's totally wrong. I mean, it depends. Uh, obviously, you shouldn't be invested in stocks with money you might need. Do you? These are retirement have, funds. Oh, yeah. Uh, but if you're, you're going to need, you shouldn't borrow money against stocks. And, and you shouldn't, uh, if you're going to need some money for college or something in a year, you don't want to be in stocks because you don't have any idea what stocks are going to sell for in a year. It's inappropriate. But stocks are safe for the long run, and they're very unsafe for tomorrow. Uh, if you call it unsafe being will you be bothered by a decline in market prices. But Berkshire, three times since I took over, has gone down roughly 50%. Did I feel poor then? No, not at all. I mean, I, I, you know, but I didn't know what I'm borrowing borrow money. I knew it was going to be worth more over time. American business is going to be worth more over time. You know, that's what you're buying as a business. You're not buying a stock. You're buying a piece of a whole bunch of businesses. I go, business is going to be worth more 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. Of course they are. But if you think you can jump in and out, or the, you know the time to come in, uh, I think you're making a mistake. In my lifetime, you said you wouldn't be surprised to see the Dow go to 100,000? Yeah, well, you're probably about 30, 35, and you've got another 50 years, <laughs> 60 years left. And, you're kind. Uh, you'll see it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's going to go. I mean, they retain earnings every year, just retained earnings. I don't like Edgar Lawrence Smith wrote a great book about that in 1924. It was, it was the rationale for the great bull market in the 20s, but he, you know, he pointed out how retained earnings actually add uh, to values. And if you own a private business and you retain the earnings every year, Berkshire's done that. And it gets to be worth more money, and that's what's happening in this world. What is a know-nothing investor? What does that mean? This person is not a professional. I'm a know-nothing doctor. I'm a know-nothing dentist. I'm a know-nothing optician. <laughs> I, I know I'm not in that business. And, and the idea that, that uh, that you're going to beat a game that you're not even necessarily trained for or spent your life at or anything like that. It's not, it's not saying the guy has a zero IQ, you can have a 200 IQ, but not be involved in investments. It's just, I don't know why light switches go on, you know. I, I think I'm generally reasonably intelligent, but I still don't know, you know. I'm a know-nothing physicist. <laughs>
but your point is for investors who don't do this for a living, it's really, really difficult to beat the index. Well, they're not going to. I mean, and, and you know, one may be lucky for a while. But the, I, the beauty of it is, you're going to do wonderful with American industry. You don't have to. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, and the experts aren't going to do it in large measure either. But you're going to do fine. So it, it isn't like I'm saying, you know, the know nothing investor is just going to be left out on the street or anything. They're going to get a great result. And, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned the past, when I, I died, I told my wife that 90% of her uh, and the trustee to have 90% of it in an index fund. It will do better on balance than what they will get if they go to professionals. Because? Because the professionals don't know how to, after fees, they don't know how to get a better result. If you take half the, half the people in the country and they don't do anything, they just own the average, they're going to get average results, right? And if they don't have any expenses, they'll get those both gross and net. The other half, by definition, have to do average. If that other part is, I mean, an average is left for them, and they're going to incur all kinds of fees, and they're going to do way better and way worse than the people in, in the, uh, in, in, who do nothing. And, and I made this bet in order to just illustrate it, and, and you know, the, the difference is incredible. I mean, the amount of money that people have wasted on in getting investment advice is just ridiculous in this country. Now, the, the, the 2 and 20 is going to make a lot of people rich, and it's going to make very few investors rich. And the, uh, it, it's, it's actually kind of, you know, it, it borders on obscene. Uh, as I said in the letter, I've known 10 or so people that with modest amounts of money, I would I bet a lot of money that they would do better than average. And I say that there are hundreds and maybe even thousands, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of hedge fund managers now, charging two and twenty is, is just ridiculous and you don't get better because you charge a lot I mean, that, does, that does not make you a, a better judge of securities or anything like that and so the good salespeople overwhelmingly are the ones that attract the money rather than the very few who are extraordinary managing money Phil Fisher who wrote that book Common Stocks and I mean, he was going to do better than average Charlie was going to do better than average in life in investments. Bill Ruane, a friend of mine, was going to do better. I, there have been a few, but there are very, very few, and then only if they work with fairly modest sums of money. Crude oil is an A factor, but general heavy industry. All right, I rest my case. <laughs> um, by the way, Bill Ruane uh, was the founder and managed the Sequoia Fund, uh, which we've used uh, and ran into a problem here last year, but uh, for 45 years. And they, uh, Sequoia actually had a 15% <coughs> compounded uh, annual growth rate for 45 years. But I, I think they also have run into a little bit of this screening issue. Um, all great value investors have have had, uh, have, I think, run into some of this there in the last few years. Um, and then um, there was a, a question at the break, um, and uh, the question was about um, somebody doing their own investing uh, and selecting their own companies. And uh, he's, he's somewhat dispelled that in there, but I'd, I'd like to kind of, um, and I don't think he would argue, if, from coming from this angle, that um, uh, what Warren Buffett talks about is a circle of competence, and uh, which you need to be successful is to identify what your circle of competence is, um, and the size of the circle is not important. But knowing where its perimeters are is essential. And the closer you stay to the center of the circle, the greater your odds of success. So somebody who doesn't invest professionally has a circle of competence. It's just much smaller. And you need to make sure you stay within that fairly tight circle. Everybody here, Peter Lynch used to talk about this, everybody knows a company in some form or another, whether it be with their hobby or whether it would be with their job or in the community that they live in, that they just see they keep building bigger factories or 
You know, everyone has the ability to identify something that uh, is special, a company that has some advantage over their peers. Uh, so uh, most, uh, like uh, the physician, will normally buy the technology company. And the technologist will buy the healthcare stuff. <laughs> and the reason is because the physician knows all everything that can go wrong with the products in their field. So their hurdle rate is much higher. But an industry that they don't know about is all blue sky. So if you stay within your circle of competency, you know, you're going to have a much tighter eye and you cuz you know you're going to know what can go wrong with that particular business. And that's why most people don't invest in the area that they know. Uh, because the area they don't know um, has a lot more uh, blue sky up upside potentially to it. And uh, I, one thing I, uh, I this idea that it's very difficult uh, not to uh, be overcome by short-term fluctuations and macroeconomic and geopolitical events. Um, you know, I, I think the people in this room, uh, sh you should congratulate yourselves, because uh, most of the people that we've dealt with have fired us over the years. Very few people have been able to stick with this and to compound their wealth at meaningful rates. It's not easy to do. It's a very difficult thing to do. And you all should feel quite good about your ability to do that. Because very few people have done it. Well, I've, got, I've got two questions back to the specific talks. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> one <clears throat> is on St. Joel. I assume you are confident they've got a good future yet. Um, since we've still got them. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about, yeah. Uh, so uh, the story of St. Joe is, uh, and I think, you know, in, in prior uh, meetings, we've talked about bubbles and how to identify a bubble. Uh, we happen to think the bubble right now is in the bond market. Um, uh, I, so it's to some degree, uh, that was a mistake on my part to be vocal about that. If you look back in history, uh, folks that have been vocal about betting against a bubble usually have had their careers ruined. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do because you're all by yourself. Um, and we, uh, we think we've uh, created uh, some kind of model that can actually see when a bubble is emerging. Um, and we thought that we saw it happening in the real estate market in uh, 2005, six, and seven. And so the idea was, I wanted to, while the, the real estate market was, had all these characteristics associated with it, bad behavior, greed, um, you know, excessive lending and all this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, the, uh, what we wanted to do was to identify um, a real estate situation uh, that when the bubble broke, we had all the work done. So that all, we didn't have to think. All, you know, we could just, you know, uh, rely upon all the work that we had done prior and in the middle of a panic, to be able to uh, accumulate a position. And um, the company was the St. Joe Company, which owns um, uh, most of the panhandle in Florida. And we researched the stock as if we owned it for probably almost four years. Uh, and watched it, we started when it was like 40, and then went to 50 and 60, and, I think that the top was almost $90 a share where it peaked out. And then when the bubble broke, uh, we started to buy it on the way down, probably in the low 30s. 
I think the last purchase we made was probably 12 or 13. <clears throat> and um, it, you know, I, we, we could have identified a, almost any real estate company that up to this point in time would have been uh, far more lucrative than St. Joe has turned out to be. Um, that said, uh, you know, the real estate market has responded dramatically. They have a lot of property. Uh, they've had to resolve uh, some issues that they had, uh, but the property's still there. Um, it's a, an attractive place in the country. Um, they actually have a, um, the whole company right now sells for, if you take the cash out, maybe $700 million. Uh, don't quote me on that, it's a guess. Um, and uh, they have a, 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 re, a active retirement community plan uh, for 177,000 units. So, in an area like Florida, if you just penciled $100,000 a unit, that's $17 billion. Um, we're not selling it yet. Uh, again, you know, th th there's no question that we could have picked a better vehicle, but that's the vehicle we picked, and we're, we're certainly not going to buy another real estate company. That, that's it. And whether it works or doesn't work, that was the one we picked, and we're going to we're, we're going to ride it all the way through. Now, one of the things that happened was that um, the, uh, the founder and the portfolio manager of the Fairhold um, Fund uh, took a very large position in the St. Joe Company, um, and uh, has actually done some pretty good things there as far as getting their cost structure in line. Um, but the Fairhome Fund, uh, as you know, we've gotten out of it for the most part, uh, and it's been really a, a very difficult thing to do. Uh, so, I mean, this is a fund that we've had tremendous success with for 20 years, um, and to get out all in one year, but uh, it's been a difficult thing to do. We tried to time it as well as we could. Most of that, as you know, went into the S&P 500. Uh, but um, his uh, reputation is not, he was known as the best manager, mutual fund manager the world's ever known uh, for about 15 years. Uh, he's now known as the worst portfolio manager, uh, just about that the world's ever known. Um, and uh, the, the fa his association, he's the chairman of the board of St. Joe. His association with the company is out now but a negative. Um, that doesn't sway our opinion one way or the other. It's the assets that we're interested in. Right. right. The other one I had a question on is Cognac. Um, and and it's hard not to be pretty delighted with him. Uh, but my question here is, at what point does that percentage in the portfolio start being a concern? Yeah, uh, our, our crack team here uh, visited Cognex, uh, when was that? September? Uh, they had an annual meeting, uh, investor meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's an extraordinary, yeah. Uh, the culture is beyond anything we could have, really could ever have dreamed of. Uh, it's this zany, uh, theatrical uh, culture, um, and um, it's a it's an industry that when we first started with it had a lot of competition. It was a, a new, exciting. It's machine vision uh, allows computers to see, um, and um, uh, there was a lot of uh, entrance because it was a young, exciting industry that everybody could see had a great future. Uh, and be we think because of their culture, uh, they have now grown to dominate that industry. There's really only one competitor that's even remotely close uh, to the strong position that they enjoy. Uh, the big story on Cognex over the years, we've owned it for a long time, and, and for a number of years, the stock didn't do anything. 
uh, and we were criticized. Oh, actually, uh, we were criticized uh, uh, quite uh, aggressively at these meetings uh, uh, by, by Bill, actually, who we love dearly, just absolutely dearly. And uh, the, the issue with Cognex is that, well, again, it's a, it's, it's, um, uh, software that enables computers to see. And so originally, in, in, at the early stages, and we're talking, uh, we bought Cognex 1992. Uh, and in the early stages, uh, really the only viable um, business um, uh, for this technology was things that humans couldn't see. They were so small that you know you couldn't do it with a human. Uh, they were not replacing uh, humans in the workplace with machines at that point in time. There was only things that couldn't be done by humans, which was only in semiconductor manufacturing. And their product was embedded in these big semiconductor mm -hmm. manufacturing machines. And they dominated that industry. And it, when we originally bought Cognex, it was 95% uh, of their business went into um, uh, semiconductor manufacturing. However, the larger opportunity was for everything you could possibly imagine. You know, robotics, inspection, um, logistics, uh, barcoding, uh, facial recognition, uh, 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 driverless cars, uh, I mean, it, it just, it's, as, it's whatever you can imagine is what this technology could do. And, um, but those things never caught traction. Or they did, but they did it slowly. Um, and it was only 5% of their business. And then it got to the point where the non-semiconductor business was consistently growing at 20% a year or above. And you just see it. It was remarkable. However, the semiconductor business became commoditized. And if anybody who knows anything about the semiconductor business, you know, its margins got squeezed. You know, it's gone through some, it's really matured as an industry. Um, and uh, uh, they like their margins, and if they can't get them, they'll walk away from business. And so, um, semiconductor business was shrinking um, at a pretty uh, significant rate while the non-semiconductor business was growing at an extraordinary rate, which to the outsider looked like Cognex was going nowhere for years and years and years, actually. Um, and then finally, about four years ago, uh, the semiconductor business got below 5% of the company. And the rocket ship became evident to everybody. And the uses for these products are really in their embryonic stage. The valuation is aggressive. We think it deserves to be. They have 20% after-tax margins consistently, which is something that no company ever. They they uh, build cash at a ridiculous rate. They write right now they have I think seven hundred million dollars in cash, which represents uh, about eight dollars a share just in cash alone. They've never carried any debt. Um, they their bid their their order rate their orders now they're starting to get orders in the manufacturing of smartphones and uh, so Apple has become a big customer. Although that they can't use the word Apple because it's a very Apple is very secretive about what they do, but they also uh, supply product to Apple's competitors. Those orders are becoming large, probably um, three times the magnitude of what one quarter was a couple of years ago. Is one order. So uh, what looks like it being expensive. You get a couple of big orders coming in after a couple of quarters, and the stock's not expensive at all. Um, you know, this is a company that 
And actually, there are very, very, very few companies that could potentially grow at 20% a year over a long period of time. Uh, we actually think this is one of them. And, uh, and according to Ben Graham, um, <clears throat> you could almost pay an indefinite am amount of money. You could, you know, the valuation you could pay for a company that could compound at that, those rates is almost infinite. Uh, but the number that we've kind of pulled out is, you know, maybe 48 to 50 times earnings. Um, it sells at something less than that now, but um, it's not cheap. And we love it, and we, um, we are, um, we are not concerned with the... Not concerned with the percentage. Yeah, it gets over 20%. Mm -hmm. We could talk. Yeah. Russ, how much do we love it? <laughs> well, I tell you, we love it. <laughs> the, uh, the, the founder of uh, Cognex uh, it was a professor at MIT, um, and his name was uh, Dr. Bob Shulman. Uh, he goes by Dr. Bob. Uh, we have a pet uh, beta fish in the office. Uh, his name's Dr. Bob. <laughs> Is that the answer to the question? <laughs> okay. Mark. Yeah, I had a question on the uh, line graph that you said. Is it available, Ginger? Mm -hmm. Ten. Ten. Yeah. Um, I haven't really talked about at the end of the graph where it goes and what we do. As it goes up for so many years. Yeah. So we we started using this graph in 2009, um, and we thought that the bottom of 2009 uh, represented a similar pattern that occurred in 1974. Uh, and from 1974, the bottom to the top of the bubble in 2000. Uh, the S&P grew 13.77% a year compounded. Uh, and we think we are in the uh, early to mid stages of something fairly similar to that. We've been saying that since 09, and we really think nothing has uh, dissuaded us from that. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to point out, uh, you know, we, we talked about bubbles and identifying bubbles, um, and that you know, I mean, there, there literally isn't a day that goes by that I don't get a, at least one call of somebody having a premonition that the stock market is topped out and is overvalued and is in a bubble or um, uh, all of the above. Um, and, um, and there's only been one time in my career, that's a 40-year career, that uh, it would have been... Um, uh, the right thing to do to take strong precautionary measures. And that was in the year 2000. Out of a 40 year career, only once. And we, we have spent countless hours in our office talking about, because I, I might, I'm probably not going to be here for the next one. I may or may not, or I may not be able to be cognizant enough to <laughs> recognize it. Um, but we've talked for hours and hours of what that pattern should look like and what valuations would look like um, during that similar uh, kind of scenario in 2000. And um, it's, a, it's a once, maybe twice in a career event. And um, we don't spend, I mean, we spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out what may happen so we're way down the road, but other than that, we don't think about it. And, um, and the rest of all this is normal fluctuations that one just has to live with. And, uh, and, 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 the, and the other, you know, I, I've got, we can go into a lot of detail on this chart than we have in the past. But if you just look at it carefully, 
Um, as long as you didn't put all your money in right here, uh, and you bought the index or something as good or better, you would have had a pretty good result. You would have had a pretty darn good result anywhere except putting all your money in right there. So if you just put your money in, in and even if you put some of it there, you'd be fine. So if, if you just added money on a somewhat regular basis, uh, you're going to avoid putting all your money in right at the top of a bubble. And we could talk for a long time about what constitutes a bubble. Um, and uh, all of those characteristics, by the way, are um, crystal clear in fixed income securities as we speak. Not in the stock market and not in the real estate. And bubbles don't recreate. It takes them decades because of people's memories. Oh my God, I never want to go through that again. <laughs> so every time things jump up a little bit, it's like, oh, everything must be overvalued and I got to get out. And, and that's good. That's what keeps this thing in check. That's how the bubbles don't get created, recreated. It's when that fear goes away that it's dangerous. And um, people, the, the last time the interest rates peaked was 1982. So any idea of what um, the world looks like in a rising interest rate environment and, uh, and the risks associated uh, with uh, interest rate risk is, uh, is not known by the majority of active investors today. There's a few of us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, does anybody know where the interest rates peaked or what, when the interest rates last peaked and at what level? It was about 18 uh, 1982. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Treasury bill rate went to 21.5%. And, and today it's basically zero. And at one point in time, a couple points in time, it went negative. Um, and that's 1982. People do not have, you know, for all of most investors' entire investing careers, all they've known is interest rates go down. Nail that. that hey. You okay? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, Bill. Would you talk a little bit about what's happening with Tar Hill? Um. Yeah. What? Who are uh, you? The, the question is. Uh, as to what's happening with our mutual fund, Tarkio. So who are your investors? How is it performing? Uh, what do you see the future being? Um, who are these people who are investing? Yeah, uh, what, what we, what we, uh, I think most of you know we launched a mutual fund in 2006. Uh, not 2006, 2011. Uh, it's a no-load fund. Uh, and stated as a $25,000 or $2,500 minimum, but we waive that uh, whenever anybody wants it. Uh, so literally it has no minimum. <coughs> and so the idea was that it's so difficult uh, for people to live with fluctuations. And our style has a little higher beta, uh, which means that when the market goes up, we go up usually more. When the market goes down, we go down a little bit more. Um, and so we know it's very <coughs> difficult for people to stick with us, um, with our process. And so the idea, part of the idea, there's a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but part of the idea was that uh, people could get exposure to what we're doing and put in only an amount of money that they could live with fluctuations. And that once they got lived through the ups and downs a bit, that they could add a little bit more over time. And that, that would create an environment where the money would stick. And that's what we wanted. We wanted the money to stick. Because we think if the money stays, uh, then we'll be able to compound it. If the money leaves, it doesn't do us any good. Stays there for a short period of time, does us no good. 
Uh, the way that we uh, are going to grow our business is by growing our investors' money. And so we got to figure out a way for it to stick. And so the idea, well, part of the idea with a mutual fund, uh, by the way, here's the Tarkio, I guess, because uh, these are, um, but uh, is that uh, to bring in uh, investors with small amounts of money. And we've done that. Uh, and, and it's, the remarkable thing is from a dead zero, uh, the fund's at $75 million today. And it's 10, 15, $5,000 at a time. And that's really what we're both proud of. How's its growth been? Good. <laughs> you want to call the board? Uh, the, 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 the expert in this field is a company called Morningstar that rates mutual funds. And uh, this is their webpage. You just touch the push in on the symbol T A R K X. And uh, there we go. And so the uh, it's a five star rated system, uh, five being the highest. Um, there's still five of them there. Uh, if you could scroll down a little bit, this is this is really what's really important. Uh, this ranks the fund uh, in our category. Um, so uh, this year, year to date, there's 645 funds in our category, which is uh, something or other. Remember what it is? Mid cap core. Mid cap core. No, that's Lippert. But mid cap growth. Oh, yeah. Um, so out of the 645 funds in our category. Year to date, uh, we're in the 42nd percentile. Uh, the one month, we're in the fifth percentile. Uh, one year, we're in the top one percentile. Uh, three years, we're in the top three percentile. And the, the number that really counts is uh, five years, we're in the top two percentile. And we compounded the money at 18.8% a year for the last five years. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question. <laughs> I happen to be ready for that one. Does, uh, does the uh, portfolio parallel that performance pretty much? Pretty much, but the, the, the big difference is that the fund, by the grace of God, has fl uh, cash flowing in all the time. So, um, uh, the, the, the mix changes a little bit. Uh, there are a couple of ideas of the fund that aren't, that I didn't want to switch out of something to buy, but I was willing to with the cash that came in. Uh, so the mix is a little bit different. Um, and it, it goes back and forth. The fund will outperform the, the personal accounts, or the, it'll, it'll go come back and forth a little bit. Uh, we haven't seen a clear pattern yet. You said you complimented us earlier and I'm standing, standing with you for so long. But I thought you said earlier that the smarter someone was and the more wealthy they were, the less likely they were. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah, well, um, you know, it, I mean, uh, that's a, the intelligence, uh, what, what's important is the discipline. Um, now, if you can get the discipline, and then add the intelligence on top of that, and you could do it for a long period of time, uh, you get the richest guy in the world, which is Warren Buffett. Um, you know, he got the discipline at a very early age. He read Ben Graham's book when he was 19. He immediately transferred to Columbia Business School to take classes from Ben Graham. Uh, like the rest of us, it was a complete epiphany. Oh my God, why didn't somebody tell me before all I was buying it as a business? Instead of being a stock market analyst and charting and God only knows what. Uh, once you get this, 
That's the foundation. And if you get it at an early age, with a reasonable amount of intelligence, you could do really well. If, you, if you're off the chart on the IQ scale, and you get that at an early age, you become the richest guy on the planet. Pure and simple. That's the Warren Buffett story. But without the discipline, the intelligence will actually kill you. <laughs> yeah, Jim. For us, I also noticed that for 2017, you've added Danaher. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, uh, when I first started looking at, uh, when I first met Phil Fisher, the first thing he did was tell me that I needed to understand everything that was going on in Japan at the time, which led to the work of W. Edwards Demi, which is really the foundation for the culture that we look for in our companies. And it's really cool stuff. Um, and then at the time, um, there's uh, these two brothers, the Rail brothers, Mitch and Steve Rail, R A L E. And um, this was back in the late 80s. And if you remember what had occurred before that, it was Ivan Boski and the corporate raiders and a lot of bad behavior um, that got cleaned out uh, during the, the decline in 1987. And uh, Mitch and Steve Rails were kind of corporate raiders, not great behavior, uh, the way that we see the world. And, um, and so by the time sort of this 1988 level, I don't know what the, the actual years were, but um, Mitch and Steve Rails bought a little company or got control of a little company called Danaher. Uh, and they must have had some kind of an epiphany. Uh, that is something similar maybe to the Michael Bilton story, that you know they just didn't, maybe, I, I don't know, I, I've never read what the whole story was, um, but they must have wanted to do something good after doing something that wasn't so good. And so uh, what they did was they got a hold of this concept uh, that uh, Toyota had perfected. Um, and uh, they brought that culture uh, into this company, Danaher, and I can't remember what their first company was, uh, and improved the, the manufacturing dramatically and increased the cash flow significantly. And then they took that cash flow and they went and found another company and brought in the Deming management style, uh, which is, by the way, is our core competency. Um, increased the cash flow, uh, took the cash flow, bought another company, installed it, and you kind of get the story. Uh, and so early on, I go, well, I'm not getting involved with these, you know, two SOBs because uh, of what I've known about them before. So I ignored Dan and her, and this thing just kept growing. Um, and then uh, every time I'd look at it, and this has been over 25 years, for God's sake. This is, this is an embarrassing story. <laughs> um, and then every time I'd look at it, I'd go, oh, wow, it's too expensive. You know, because the stock always carried a, a pretty good premium uh, once they started to get a reputation that they knew what they were doing. And then the only times that the stock really got clobbered was when everything was getting clobbered. Uh, during large stock market declines. And it's during those, it's during those panics that I want to own, I want to buy what I know. I don't want, I, I usually don't add a new security um, during panics. I want to buy what I already know so I can go in and go in strong. And so the only time Danaher got cheap is during a market panic and I had other things that I wanted to buy ahead of it. So we never bought it, and it just kept going and going. And I, um, I believe of all the publicly traded securities over the last 25 or 30 years, the most, uh, the one that's compounded people's money um, more than any other publicly traded U.S. security is Danaher. 
and we missed it totally. And it's really embarrassing. And then it got to this, this huge size, and then they started to buy uh, test and measurement companies about Tektronix and a couple of other companies in test and measurement area. And we already own the best company in that area, which is National Instruments, that we love. And then we also own Agilent uh, at one point in time, which was the, the core of the Hewlett Packard story. Uh, so we had two companies in test and measurement. So again, I kept passing and passing. I'd look at it and it passed and it kept going up. And, um, and so, uh, and, and over time, there's a test and measurement business and had some other businesses. Uh, they made craftsman tools, uh, which supplies products to a dying retailer. Uh, there was some stuff in there that I just didn't like. Uh, and again, I passed. And then uh, about a year ago, uh, they bought a company that I always was fairly attracted to, which is a company called Paul. And with Paul, Paul is a water treatment company. They make test and measurement, uh, kind of, not test and measurement, they make all kinds of products uh, for water purification. Uh, and it's an area that I've always had an interest in. I got involved early with a couple of companies that got fried on, uh, but uh, uh, always was attracted to. And uh, Dan her bottom. And it's a very large company and it really changed a large portion of Danaher into this industry that I like. And then six, seven months ago, they spun off a company called Fortiv. And in Fortiv, which they split the company in two, in two publicly traded stocks, and then um, Fordham owned the craftsman business. They owned all the test and measurement businesses. Uh, they got rid of all the stuff I didn't like. And suddenly, Danaher was at a size that was um, uh, not too large anymore because they spun off all this other stuff. And they bought a large company that gave them a lot of horsepower when they changed the culture of Paul. It was a big company that they bought. And by transitioning Paul, you know, would have a big impact on their bottom line. And it was a company I liked, but I didn't really know the management well. And now I know that the management is being run by a Deming process. And so when they broke the companies in two, uh, Ford took out like a rocket ship and Danaher nosedived. And that was our entry point. And we hope to own Danaher for a long, long, long time. And we also own a sister company uh, called Colfax. Uh, and by the way, um, we, in, uh, I don't know if anybody uh, owns the uh, Tarkio Fund Direct, uh, the last several letters that we put in the, the, uh, your monthly, your quarterly statement have been a profile of the companies that we own. Um, and we've sent those out on our email list. By the way, um, if anybody's not getting our emails, they can sign up here. Um, in fact, maybe should we pass that around? Good. Are people okay if we pass around an email and you sign up? Email you're, not, you're not getting them. Um, and so there's several companies that we profile here. You can grab one of these on your way out if you want, if you haven't read them. Uh, and uh, the Colfax, Dan and her story, stories in one of those, as well as Cognitz. Yeah, Bill. You made the comment about discipline investing. I would like to give the people here an example of what my wife accomplished with discipline investing with you. She put in a total of $8,000 in her IRA back when, if you had a pension, you could still put money in an IRA. So this was early 80s. I think she put in a total of $8,000. At the end of April, it was $364,000. Thank you, Bill. Wow. I think that's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> it wasn't easy, though. No. You had to live with a tremendous amount of Oh, yes, yeah, so we were talking when she crabbed. Because, you know, you know 2009, 1987, 2001, all of the, you know, several wars, several recessions, um, all the, you know, different 
uh, leaders of our country and other countries, uh, terrorist attacks, everything imaginable is built into those numbers. And she's on vacation with Italy now. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? All right, it's nine o'clock. Is there we'll go once, twice? In rooms like this, this is an academic. Every student has his or his or her eye right there. It's nine o'clock. We're out of here. <laughs> Sp that was spoken great. by a true professional in this <laughs> standing at this podium. Uh, I want to just thank. Oh, go ahead. I just say, Russ, if you had one book that you would recommend to read, what would that be? Well, I got a bunch of them. <laughs> um, but I normally a good the starter book is the Warren Buffett book, and then we got a series of them that we would recommend thereafter. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.